This is ATL Day Ones, part of Locked On Sports Atlanta. And it starts now. It is ATL Day Ones with Jarvis and Tanitri. We want to welcome you back on a good old Tuesday. We're not, we, we weren't here on Monday. We told y'all that on Friday. So if you were upset that we weren't here, we want to say, hey, we were looking out for you. We let you know at the end of the show on Friday. But we are back. And we also want to always, always thank you for making us ATL Day Ones, that is, your first listen of the day. And remember, we are free and available wherever you download your podcast. And we always ask you, have one more request, right? We want to ask you to, once you go to the podcast platform that you download your stuff from, once you download us, once you listen, go ahead and make a five, leave us a five-star review. You know, for you know, for us because we know you like us and you know we rock with us all day, every day. So now we got a we got a lot of good stuff on board. We're gonna talk about the Atlanta Falcons and how this Arthur Smith led offense can be better or not. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the Atlanta Hawks. What can we draw from the Boston Celtics and uh, the Warriors? Is there a blueprint to find somewhere there for Travis Link and the Atlanta Hawks? And maybe even Tony Russell can get involved as well. We'll get into that. But And last but not least, and for the culture, the Johnny Manziel lookalike wanted to do what on the sidelines? <laughs> but, but before we get there, we got to talk. start with the Atlanta Falcons, uh, T. You know, um, there have been a lot of conversations about you know, the Atlanta Falcons needing to add more weapons to this offense for Arthur Smith. It seems like Terry, Terry Fontano heard that message. Yeah. He, he, yeah. He, he took heed to, to the um, office of mind, the head coach. And with the basketball teams like players that they bought in here, not six, eight, six, seven guys, but, you know, but six, three, six, four, six, five, six, six. You know, they are locked and loaded as yeah. far as if they want to do a pickup basketball game <laughs> after practice <laughs> up there in Flowery Brent. So, um, my whole thing is, you know, thinking about it and kind of looking at some of the numbers and where they were off offensively last year, T. Mm -hmm. um, do you see this offense being better than it was last year? I do. I do. And I think it's because it was what Terry Fontenot and Arthur Smith did to round out the offense. So right. great that you added a Drake London to give one more weapon to the receiving core overall because of course we know receivers and tight ends but sort of to, to that that receiving game if you will and to help out so that kyle pitts is not the only target that you have to pay attention to right there you go and alameda Zacchaeus definitely you know he's serviceable if you will and then going out and getting one uh brian edwards uh from from the raiders that that should uh help out tremendously as well just in terms of again rounding out that room but for me it was really what they did to add to the running back room as well. I, I, I feel like there's going to be some competition, some right. healthy competition, maybe not to who that first string back is in Cordero Patterson, but maybe to give, and not just competition to Cordero, but also to give Arthur Smith and Dave Ragone some different kind of pieces to play with, right? right? So whether or not Damian Williams starts to show his old self, his former self, or whether you see some good sparks out of Tyler Algier, or as you and I, with a little bit of a head scratcher for us um, to see uh, Williams essentially go from specialist to possibly the secondary room to the running back room to see Avery kind of make that move. Yeah. Intriguing, if nothing else. So it could provide something there. And of course, we've been talking about the fact that when you uh, release the likes of, and I know I'm going defense here, but follow me here. But when you start mm -hmm. to release the likes of a John Kaminsky, or, you know, we're looking at what is going on with um, Deion Jones and the possibilities. We don't know what's, what's going to happen there, but you just never know. Oh, we know. We just don't know how. When you talk about uh, even a little bit of opportunity for there to be some salary cap space, just to give maybe possibly shoring up some more things on that O-line, Jarvis, I kind of like the direction they're going, and I think they put themselves in position to be better and no. Hey, look, who doesn't like a good quarterback competition in terms of you got something serviceable, possibly, and Marcus Mariota, but <laughs> you got Desmond Ritter lurking. No doubt about it. And I think two good things that, that, that stood out for me for what, what you and what you just said, right? Like 
you talk about the running back, the addition of Tyler Algier, right? And then you talked about the offensive line. Like, the offensive line and the running backs are pretty important when it comes to the running game, right? So, looking at last year, let's look at – I'm bringing up to give you this stat from last year. The Falcons were 31st in rushing yards per game last year. It was in about 83 yards clip per game. Yeah. You know, and, and, and that's – and what has uh, and for Arthur Smith to, I I think in order for his offense to be successful, that's kind of where it has to live, right? And 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 that's how I answer this question because is the running game going to be better? Because that's the mm-hmm. only way this offense gets better. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like they were 16th in passing yard per game because we know a, a lot of that was, you know, depending on you know who they had at quarterback, right? Matt Ryan, and right. you know, and, and being able sometimes trash yards. Let's just be real. And right, of course, yeah, because they were down in games because they had no choice but to pass. Oh, yeah, so, yeah, so that that's the that's how that that's how the offense that was the storyline from last year, right? Mm-hmm. And they got behind in games. The defense couldn't stop anybody, so they wanted to run the football, but they couldn't. So they had to figure out creative ways in order to move the football up and down the field. Mm-hmm. So that's what you, that's how you ended up where you are in the middle of the league in passing yards per game and in yeah. the bottom of the league in rushing yards per game. Mm-hmm. So that's how I'm going to answer that question. And I was just like. I don't know because they have the same offensive line coming back from last year as the projected starters. I say projected starters because there's still a chance, Mm -hmm. you know, they can go out and make some moves. And we've talked about on this show continuously, you know, J.C. Treader, I've been Mm -hmm. an advocate for him as well. And it seems like people agree with me who do their shows on YouTube as well. So, you know, (laughs) know, there's a little shot there. Sorry. I had to get in there. But um, (laughs) I think that when you put all of these things together and, and you start to think about what, how this offense can be better. I think they have to run the football. There is no other way in order for them to be better. I don't care how many weapons you have. You can have Randy Moss and Terrell Owens, you know, little brothers out there playing on on, on, on with a Falcons uniform on, and they will not be better because yeah. Arthur Smith, the offense starts with the run game because he wants to play action. He wants to get his quarterback out on the edges in that play yeah. action and get them on the move and, and move those defenses and get those guys to thinking when and when it comes to what coverages they're going to be in. So that's for me. I think that's why that's the most important piece is the running game going to be better. And the only way the running game be better is the offensive line is better. Agree. And also to get some improvement. There was some, I'm going to call it incremental improvement in red zone efficiency, if you will, but mm-hmm. where you really get your success. And you, I'm talking about truly, truly moving, moving the needle, especially in that lower red zone, is for you to have a back, in addition to CP, who you feel like if you just need to gain that one yard or you oh, just yes. need to gain its fourth and inches, you feel confident that you've got the running back to either get you that extra four downs or just punch that bad boy in right away. So that's why I'm looking and saying, ah, everybody is focusing, not these two folks on this this show, but everybody else no. has been focusing on that, that receiving room slash tight end room. But I think where they're going to really make their bread and butter, which actually speaks also to Arthur Smith and how he had success with the Titans. It wasn't just about the tight end room, although everybody loves to talk about tight ends. It was about Derrick Henry. And what he was able to get out of that offense with the Titans because of Derrick Henry. So you're right. That's where this offense is going to see its success or kind of leveling out at the end of the day. At the end of the day. We, well, speaking of leveling out, how about the Atlanta Braves? I think that's the perfect segue, right? <laughs> well, they lose to the Diamondbacks 6-2. to two, um, And, you know, that, that's one of the things that, T, like it is so frustrating sometimes when, when we talk about this team, right? Because, yeah. you know, there's, you know, there's some excitement, right, that happened over the weekend. We didn't get a chance to talk about it. Michael Harris made his debut. He was able to go one for three you know, on Saturday and, you know, and get his first major league hit. And they they started showing all the pictures when he was a, a youngster, first drafted by the Braves and being a Braves fan. And it was just – everything was all good. It was the perfect setup, right, for them yeah. to, you know, go on a little win streak. And they didn't do that. So yeah. I, I think that when you think about, you know, playing a team like the Diamondbacks and, and, and Spencer Stroud again, his first, you know, first start of the year. And, and, mm-hmm. and, you know, it just – and it just seems like 
it was just more of the same with them, right? Because you had the 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 the, flu, the kerfuffle and, the, yeah. and Mar- Marcelo Zuna and then Matt Olson, yeah, Olson, you know, and it's just like, what are y'all doing? Like, this is simple stuff. This is yeah. not even asking you to go above and beyond what you're what you're called to do because. Matt Olson won a Golden Glove in, in 2018 and 2019. So, like, what are we really – like, you, you're dropping balls? Like, like what – like, this is, these are the type of things that they have to get corrected. And I think that there's nothing from an outside perspective or outside force that can get them to do it. I think they just have to simply do it. Yeah, I, I would agree. And it's frustrating because Spencer Strider, it gets lost in the shuffle that he struck out set. Okay, I know. and only walked two. So if you hadn't dug a hole for him and extended the inning, the, inning, yes. the way you did so early, then you also made you put a, a lot of pressure on an offense that has tendencies to sputter. So right, I mean, right away you're putting them in a position of liability to the point where it really made me ask, okay, all right, I know Alex Anthopoulos, he'll go with an experiment in a heartbeat. Braves made the decision to bring Marcelo Zuna back. We all kind of got it. Okay, fine. But now, here we are. We know it's the first mile marker, Memorial Day. You're nine and a half games out of first place in the division. Now, yes, you are second, but that's probably because the rest of your division looks like it looks like just be honest. It's some poo poo, too. <laughs> more important point is that you're 23 and 26, and the Mets ain't metting quite yet. Okay. Yeah. So that's where it starts to become a concern of like, okay, Alex Anthopoulos is not afraid to make a move. So if a birdie on the street said that Jorge Soler, who is actually doing pretty decently as far as his RBI, he's still in the top 20. Still knocking the ball out of the park, too. Exactly. Mm-hmm. And he's still getting home runs. So if he's getting players, if players are in position and he's actually knocking, you know, running batters in, and he's actually getting home runs as well. Maybe if he's interested in coming back, maybe that's an experiment that should be tried because, hey, the Adam Duvall experiment, at least for the back end of last season, bringing him back and a portion of this season did work to some degree. So I don't know. I feel like, yes, we've gotten to this place. We kept staving it off, staving it off and saying, OK, let's see. Uh, let's wait until Memorial Day and see what it's looking like. Well, this is what it's looking like. Yeah, and this is what it's looking like because, you know, you're watching us on YouTube. You're also actually listening to us on all your podcast platforms. Yeah, when you go to YouTube, put it, drop in that Locked On Sports Atlanta in that search box and we'll pop right up our beautiful, well, Tanisha, Tanisha's beautiful face will pop up. <laughs> and we'll, we'll make sure you just check us out there. Make sure you do that. We uh, appreciate you for liking and subscribing to our YouTube channel. But coming up next, T. The Boston Celtics and the Golden State Warriors are in the NBA championship. What can the Atlanta Hawks learn from them? How did they get there? We'll discuss all of that next on Locked On Sports Atlanta. It's ATL Day Ones with Jarvis and T.